Hey folks, thank you so much for watching. For those who know me and for those who maybe see me for the first time, I'm Deborah Tuff, Media Relations Manager and Spokeswoman for Gwinnett County Government. I'm here in the auditorium of the Gwinnett Justice and Administration Center in Lawrenceville, where our Board of Commissioners makes decisions that benefit our residents. But right now, the backdrop of this auditorium serves a very different purpose, to shed light on a very important time in our history, in our framework, Women's History Month. I am absolutely honored to moderate the panel discussion of these incredible women beside me, amazing, who've made history of their own. We'll get to that in a bit, but joining me to talk about that very topic, Gwinnett County Chairwoman Nicole Hendrickson, who is my chairwoman, by the way, okay? Douglas County Chairwoman Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones. Yes, you heard me. She is a doctor. Cobb County Chairwoman Lisa Cupid and Henry County Chairwoman Carlotta Harrell. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is an amazing moment in history. In fact, the theme for this very moment, celebrating women who tell our stories. And that's exactly what we're here for, kicking this off. Each of you has a very unique story, uh, one that is literally for the books. Uh, but the most obvious story that's being told right now is that of the 159 counties in this state, you all are the only black women to lead four major counties. Let that sink in. Has it? Anyone? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, actually mm -hmm. that, that it's, it's pretty remarkable, incredible. Not only do we lead four counties out of the 159, mm -hmm. we lead the largest metropolitan counties. Um, so our populations, um, we, we serve a lot of residents collectively, right. we serve over a million residents, just the four of us, yeah. um, when you combine all of our populations together. But uh, it's, it's truly incredible um, to, when you think about and putting that into context. Oh, that's huge. Now, Women's History Month is not just about realizing the contributions uh, that women have made, uh, but applauding them and taking that torch and running uh, with them. As a woman in a male-dominated industry, industry, how have you taken that torch and run with it? Well, I'll chime in. Uh, certainly, I believe that a uh, woman, this is our time, mm -hmm. number one. And certainly, when I took office, I said, there's no room for second place. And for women, there's no room for second place. We've mm -hmm. had our moments with women's suffrage and things of that sort and the feminist movement. Now, it, it is our time. And I believe that uh, women uh, were made for this moment. And I feel that we are doing more than just a good job. We're doing, uh, we're ch uh, chasing excellence uh, to, we're chasing perfection to achieve excellence. That's absolutely amazing. And Chairwoman Cupid, yeah. I see you looking and yeah. nodding. Um, so there's there's something that wants to come out. Let's talk Certainly. about that. Certainly, yeah. it's humbling to be honored for Women's History Month, but I think it's important for us to normalize what we've done for mm. women. We are about half of the population and we're leading every day. We're leading our families, we're leading in community, we're leading in the workspace. The accomplishment of these women mm -hmm. were no minor tasks. And it should be a natural gravitation that we wanna lead in the spaces where we live. And so I want to encourage all women to perceive that even though we have opportunity to uniquely recognize um, our service that we don't want to be unique in this effort. We are a reflection of who they are. We're mm -hmm. a reflection of the women that came before us who led and we're very honored. I feel very blessed to be in a platform to be able to um, speak of the service that we've already been providing in our communities um, through my service as chair. Wow, you know, if you had a mic right now, you could drop you could drop that mic because you sum this this whole thing up. Um, and they say, you know, behind every great superhero is an even better backstory. Yeah. I mean, Chairwoman Harrell, you came from Henry County as a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Chairwoman Cupid, an engineer. Chairwoman Jackson Jones, you are a doctor. You have an EDD and you practice medicine as well. Worked in surgery, and was the operations manager at the Children's Health Care Atlanta for my 15 year 40 year career, Wow! the last 15 wow. years of my 40 year career. That's amazing. And then Chairwoman Hendrickson, you brought Gwinnett County together even before becoming chairwoman. But before that, you work with kids to bring families together. 
to make sure they were okay. Mm -hmm. How did those paths in your career lead you to this point in county government? Well, I'll, I'll start in, in saying that my service to the community, um, you know, was, I, I was involved long before my name was ever on the ballot. Um, and I've always had a passion for service, um, you know, because of my personal background and my upbringing. Um, you know, and I've always had social workers who have helped my family. And um, I've always uh, been drawn to the helping profession because of the adversity that I faced mm -hmm. uh, growing up. And I've always wanted to be a social worker mm -hmm. and help those who had the misfortune and did not see a way uh, mm -hmm. to help themselves and their families. And so I've just always been on that trajectory and that path of um, building families, building individuals, building communities. Um, it led me to Georgia. I attended the University of Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, got my degree in social work, uh, my master's in social work from the University of Georgia. And from there, I've started my work in Gwinnett County. And it's led me uh, to the county government mm -hmm. and working with my predecessor on issues in building bridges with our very diverse population and communities. And um, I've just had a passion and desire to ensure that everyone had a seat at the table. And uh, when it was time uh, to go further and um, step up and serve in a way uh, that was much bigger than myself and much bigger than I could ever have imagined, uh, it really was the people who said, we need you to step up and serve us. And so I've answered that call. And I truly believe that we are all here because of a greater calling. Mm. Anyone else? Absolutely. And just to echo on what Chairwoman uh, Hendrickson said, uh, when you look at all of us, there are backstories um, that brought us to where we are today. I grew up in a family. My father was a pastor. Mm. And he marched alongside Dr. King. and. Mm. Congress, Congressman Lewis doing the civil rights. So I was brought up in a household um, as a pastor's daughter doing the civil rights movement. And so they were always, my parents were always engaged in the community. It was always about helping people, giving back, and being part of your community, trying to make a difference. And so that's kind of what led me into law enforcement. I always knew that that's what I wanted to do. And you know, my career in law, law enforcement, as a law enforcement officer, you're always trying to protect and serve and do what's best for your community. Which, you know, again, you know, just being active in my community. And when you look, across, look at women across the state of Georgia, especially like those that serve in the House of Representatives, Georgia has the most black women that serve in the House of in, in the in, in the state legislature than any other state. Mm -hmm. And so being able to work along some of those women who were my mentors, you know, as I was coming up, you know, led me to where I am today, going from a police lieutenant working the streets to become the chairwoman of the county. It was important for me to continue to be able to serve my community and being able to serve it in a way that you're trying to make um, your constituents' lives better than what they are. So, absolutely. Wow. In the words of Kamala Harris, certainly I may be the first, but I won't be the last. But however, I do want to say that I stand on the shoulders of my father, who was a paratrooper in the Korean War, who actually was right there on the battlefield. And certainly his, as his daughter, I followed his footsteps and joined the Army and served three years of my time. And then I've, on, I've served not only at the uh, political level and the governmental level, but, and also the uh, spiritual level, but I've served as a choir director um, of a church, mm. I was a Sunday school teacher, uh, professor at Brown Mackey College of Atlanta. I was an adjunct professor for uh, anatomy and physiology and wow. surgical technology and medical assistant assisting, and did that as well. And then certainly, as I've mentioned, the operating room for. 40 years of the career, just the, and also had a clinical background, was on the field with the surgeons, uh, primarily for nine years of my 40 year career. But I said all that to say this, that service starts from the heart. You mm -hmm. have to be committed, 
you have to be dedicated to serve and you have to, when others go to bed at night, you are burning, burning lights to make sure you make a difference in someone's life. So um, this is a great experience. Um, black um, women, you all are doing great things and I've, I'm just proud of what we all have done uh, collectively to, to move uh, our counties forward and not only our counties, but this nation forward. Wow. Thank you. Wow. You know, it's great to sit here and to listen to the path of my fellow chairwomen. Um, it's humbling to hear about all that they've done, but it also, again, lets me know just how well qualified we are, whether it's through our profession or even through the challenges in life that we had. Mm -hmm. um, I think that God leaves no stone um, uncovered. He uses all of our experiences to help propel us forward. And I see that, and I see that not just in our capacity to serve, but in the heart of all the women that I serve with. We truly care about people. And um, I've seen that in how I've served, not only in my role as chair, but even as an engineer, it's always been about how do you make processes um, work? How do you continuously improve. Mm -hmm. And I see that translation in serving as chair, but at the end of the day, whether you're working on widgets, whether you're serving in public safety, whether you're on the front lines of health, we are all about people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that um, resonates with all of our experiences. And, you know, there's a saying, and it's not even a saying, it's a scientific fact that pressure creates diamonds. Mm -hmm. You all spoke about challenges and adversities. I mean, you grew up during the civil rights era when it was not easy. Black folks couldn't even sit at a restaurant. They could, they had to go to different fountains. And you all are sitting here leading counties in the very state that helped spearhead that movement. When thinking about pressures, because I see four beautiful diamonds. <laughs> Do you face challenges in your position? And how do you deal with them? Every challenge is an opportunity, in my opinion. Uh, certainly, I grew up in the uh, civil rights era as well. Mm -hmm. And actually, Martin Luther King was assassinated in my city, Memphis, and we apologize oh. wholeheartedly every day mm -hmm. for that moment. Um, I was in the fifth grade when that happened, 10 years old, so I do remember that was a huge challenge to overcome an obstacle that I knew that had a profound effect on this entire country. But challenges are a part of daily life. Uh, you have to wake yes. up and look yourself in the mirror and say, how far can I go? And how willing am I to take on the next uh, challenge that's coming? Because when you, uh, a challenge is nothing but managing the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Because in our roles, we have not a clue what's going to happen day to day. We just prepare for the unexpected. Uh, the pandemic, for <laughs> prime example, that, right. that slipped in on all of us. Mm -hmm. But we took it, and I believe we are all resilient women, and we have been able to master this, and we're prepared for the next pandemic, but I'm quite sure it comes every 100 years, so another group of women <laughs> will be sitting here. <laughs> but uh, certainly, um, I, I look at every challenge as an opportunity. And I think we all face um, challenges in our respective roles. Um, but if you think about the civil rights movement, and I look back, and I even said this in, in my um, address at my inauguration, is during that time, we couldn't even vote. Mm -hmm. could not. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. My mom could not vote. These women before me could not vote. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're sitting in this chair, in these chairs, <laughs> are really a testament wow. of how far we've come. Yeah. And so I don't take that for granted. And I know that I'm in this seat because it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It is about the people that are gonna come after us, mm -hmm. um, you know, and pay, continuing to pave that way, you know? So the challenges, we have to look at them as opportunities because they're gonna come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have to fight through that noise because there are people that are depending on us to lead and serve in a way uh, that they had not been served before, yes. um, right. you know? And so we, we the, that's, that's something I don't take for granted. And, um, you know, I receive that responsibility and I take on that challenge, um, you know, with great humility and with great responsibility. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
Now, this is a two-part question. Okay. Uh, and I, I will say I've been on the giving end of this question. But then as I got older, I was like, why, why do I ask that? Why do, why do people ask that? Um, in certain forms, you hear women who are in leadership, whether it's the CEO of a company, in your case, leading a county. You have, if I have an interviewer ask, as a woman and a mother, how do you balance the two? But the male counterparts never get that question. Well, as a father mm -hmm. and a chairman, mm -hmm. how do you balance those jobs? Mm -hmm. Do you still think there's some inconsistency when it comes to normalizing, as Chairwoman Cupid mentioned earlier, women in leadership and their male counterparts? I, I think men need to be asked that question more, <laughs> to, yeah. to be quite honest, because how are we ever going to normalize um, you know, uh, women being in leadership roles. Uh, Three of us are actually raising, have raised sons, and we recognize the importance of our sons seeing us in these roles, yeah. but also dispelling gender stereotypes that women are supposed to be the caretakers and the men are supposed to be the providers. We, we are showing proof yeah. that we can take on any role and our sons need to see that and their sons need to see that. Um, and going back to what Chairwoman Cupid said, you know, women need to be normalized in these spaces um, because men are providers and caretakers, women are providers and caretakers. Mm -hmm. We can be both, it's both and, not either or. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, you know, when I, when I get that question, it, it just drives me, you know. Right, <laughs> right, right. What, what, what do you mean? Uh, how am I doing both? Um, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's possible. We're showing that it's possible, yeah. you know? Yes. Cause you're a cadence game front and center. <laughs> I'm volunteering at his <laughs> games. <laughs> yeah, not only am I cheering, I'm actually, I'm yeah. volunteering at the score table yeah. and keeping time right. and bringing snacks. <laughs> and then turning around and doing a public hearing. And then turning around and doing a public hearing. And so, starting yeah. all over the next That's day. Right. And then cooking dinner. And okay. then cooking dinner. Washing clothes. And women do a better job at multitasking. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Say it again for the people in the back. Okay. Women do a better job at multitasking. Yes, ma'am. We really you had know, no choice. We had no choice. Right. I yeah. mean, you, you ra you're taking, you're raising a family, mm -hmm. and you, and you, you know, you have your career, yeah. and your children are involved in activities, mm -hmm. and you're involved in activities in your community. Mm -hmm. So we're just, we're just better at multitasking. That's right. Yeah. I think. The question you asked in the interview room could be balanced if it were asked of men, not just to normalize women being in that space, but for men to normalize the balance they need as well mm, yes. when they take on whatever role that they take. You know, I can tell you perhaps there was a time I would have taken offense at that question, but now as a mom of 12 and 14 year old boys, I take that as a badge of honor. You know, when my children were infants, and I was in law school. When I used to walk into class, I used to give myself a personal round of applause of all the work that I did just to get my butt in a chair and to perform and participate as any other student in the class. Wow. And I feel like as women, when we walk in the room, do you know how much we did before we even stepped our foot in this office? Yes. We come prepared, we come ready. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that diaper bag has changed into my work bag. What do you need? I got it. <laughs> but that we've learned to always have everything with us, on us, to respond to whatever need comes before us. And as frustrating as it has been with my husband being in a very busy role and us calibrating our time, as us both being caretakers of our children, I've learned to not be as frustrated as I used to be because I feel like every day I take care of my family and I take care of my community, I become stronger and I become more humble mm -hmm. because I know that even if I wasn't chair, that woman standing at the bus stop had to do the same thing worthy of applause when she got to stand there. Yes, and anybody else that comes into our office had to do the same thing. And so um, sometimes it's frustrating. I can't say it's a balance, but I wear it now as I'm um, raising older children. I, I wear it as a badge of honor. Yes, yeah. yes. A woman's work is really never done, um, it, according to my mother. She said, your work is never done. She'll oh. call us, I have the clothes going cooking, what have you. But I will like to support our males 
Because I look at this era of males or this generation of males, they are very supportive to women yes. being successful. Amen. And they are really some of our biggest cheerleaders. Yes. They stand behind you. They're so proud. Yes. Uh, certainly as the chairwoman of Douglas County, the men there just said, we're just so proud of you. Yeah. You're so resilient. You're so strong. I said, am I really? Yeah. But I appreciate all the kind words for them because they're Amen. really the wind beneath my wings. Amen. The male, uh, the men of Douglas County, I'll say for yeah. sure. As I'm in the grocery store, as I'm walking through the neighborhoods, yeah. communities, they really have been supportive. And some of my biggest supporters are my males mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Douglas County, I'll just say for say, just, they just say uh, the strength of a woman. Um, sometimes I'm refer referred to as Harriet Tubman mm -hmm. of, of leading Douglas County because we've uh, broken some glass ceilings, we've made some, we changed the game. And mm -hmm. I could not change that game without the male support. Mm -hmm. So I really, That's I'm speaking on just to support them as yeah. well. And speaking of glass ceilings, you took that hammer and you you banged that ceiling out. You yes. were the first black chairwoman ever in the history of Georgia. Yeah. She came before us. She before came before us. That, that <laughs> deserves a round of applause. What was that like? <laughs> I'm curious. When the ceiling was broken, I said, what happened? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just, it's humbling. It was just, uh, Unbelievable, I didn't realize that that had never happened. And I wasn't running to be the first. Again, I wanted to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And just to have uh, that noted in the history books, it means a lot to me. It, it shows other young women that if you try hard enough, you can do anything yes. in life. Um, you have to be committed. Uh, I, in, in Douglas County, I beat a 50 year establishment. It was a 50-year establishment. Uh, the family was considered the Kennedys, and I just couldn't believe that that happened. But hard work pays off. Failure is not final, because mm. I had run before and didn't win, but I received 48.3% the first time I ran as chairman, a chairwoman of Douglas County. And um, I said, hmm, this feels pretty good. Let me try it one more time, because failure is not final. Mm, yeah. And then I always say that your setback is a setup for your comeback. Yes, ma'am. And I was able to push through. Mm, and I so when my that. head peeked out the glass ceiling, I said, uh oh, ladies, let's move. Yeah, we came following behind her in yeah. 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Challenges that pressure. Like I said, it creates diamonds. Yes. It creates diamonds. Um, and just, I did a bit of digging on all of you. Yes. They say that you have, how old is your daughter? 24? No, my baby's 38. 38. <laughs> You showed up to every single one of her plays, everyone, every one everyone. Pro production, mm -hmm. regardless of Dr. Uh, Jackson, regardless of whether you were uh, having to perform or organize a surgery, you were there. So going back to the point of women, we can do anything, yes. anything. That's amazing. So speaking of which, what would you all tell your younger self today, whether 11 year old girl, mm -hmm. college bound young lady, or 20 something graduate? If you could look in the mirror and you were reverted back to, I guess you're 21, so about what, 10 years ago for all of y'all? <laughs> <laughs> Take us back. What, we, what would we you, wish. 20 years ago. Yeah, what would you, what would you say to that little girl? I would say to myself, this 10 year old girl, uh, I, I won fifth grade president back in 1968 uh, of my class. At, uh, and it was 300 students that had to vote for me. I was a nominee out of it was four classes, but total 300 of all of us. And I'll never forget, it was the year that Nixon was elected president. So a, a big election was held at the school and I won. Mm -hmm. I had not a clue. I didn't even want to be nominated. But I said, I must be a leader. So I'm saying you others see things in you that you don't see in yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, I was inaugurated, the whole nine yards sworn in in the fifth grade. So that was the beginning of my my idea for moving things forward and serving as a leader. That, I, I guess, again, like I said, others see things in you that you don't see in yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm this quiet storm, but others said, no, you're power packed. You move, you move mm -hmm. things forward. So it's almost like a a person singing in the choir, you have a beautiful voice. You don't think you sing that well, but others think you sound like a songbird. So all four of us were born to lead. Yeah. Sometimes I believe you're born to do certain yeah. things. Right. You know, I, That's my response to the news reporters when they said, well, what, what, did, 
why did you do this and how did you become? I said, first of all, thanks to God. He's the, the, the head of my life and he's the one that really is the reason why I'm here. But I did make it clear that some folks are just born to lead. Mm -hmm. I'm a middle child, so I know how to balance the room. <laughs> there was right. three of us, so I knew how to get in the middle and go with both of them and just make them feel good. Mm -hmm. Then that's what I do best. I'm, I'm good. I'm a, I'm a, a bridge builder, mm -hmm. a peacemaker. And so I just feel comfortable serving others wow. in this role. Wow. I've always loved to serve. So I was giving you time, chairwoman. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, well, are we going in order? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I would tell my my younger self, my ten year old self, um, you know, to to always believe and bet on yourself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I I I don't come from a long line of. Um, you know, members in my family who uh, were highly educated. You know, I had to put myself uh, through college. Um, you know, I, ev everything uh, that I worked for, um, you know, I had to believe in myself. Um, you know, even getting this position because um, there were a lot of uh, doubters and, and people who said, you can't, it's not your time. Um, this is not for you. You need to do something else. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but I always bet on myself mm -hmm. and, and I would always tell my, my 10 year old self and any 10 year old girl, um, to always bet on yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, if no one's mm -hmm. going to believe in you, um, you have to believe in yourself and you have the power to do anything and be anything that you want to be. And I'm living proof of that. Believe and you shall achieve. Believe and you shall achieve. And I just say, stay focused. Yeah. yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, I can remember my 10 or 11 year old self. I was a tomboy. <laughs> um, I always knew I wanted to be in law enforcement because I used to play cops and robbers and I was, <laughs> I was always the police officer. Um, but you know, you're gonna have, you're gonna make mistakes. You're going to fall down and stumbles. Mm -hmm. Just dust yourself off, pick yourself up. Yeah. And you know, it, it doesn't say that you can't continue to move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, life brings challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, it's how you, the choices you make and how you overcome those challenges mm -hmm. that kind of molds you into the person that you are becoming. And so I would say, just make sure you stay on top of your schoolwork, stay focused. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't be whatever it is that you want to be. And so that's what I would say to my 10 year old self. Yeah. Little Lisa, <laughs> <laughs> I would say thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for not giving up. Mm -hmm. And thank you for not giving in. Um, I f r around the age of maybe middle school, I think I could have gone down either path. I didn't always make decisions that I would have think I would have thought would have brought me to where I am but I was somebody who always believed in what was right, mm -hmm. even when it wasn't popular. Right. And I had a strange sense of speaking up for what is right, mm -hmm. even as a little girl who wasn't popular. Um, sometimes I share the story of my parents being from another country. And even though I was born in New York, which is a very multicultural environment, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and Southfield, Michigan specifically, which at the time was not. Mm -hmm. And so I was viewed as different and that difference wasn't necessarily appreciated. And there were times where I felt like I wanted to be in a cocoon, um, but I think it created in me a sense of awareness of other people who may have been suffering around me mm -hmm. and as even though I may have wanted to kind of hunker down internally as a child, whenever I saw something happening to someone else, that's when a light bulb would switch mm. and I would end up speaking up and standing up for others. And I can't take anything away from my childhood because I think the uniqueness of it, the challenges of it, the awkwardness of it 
has helped to create an enduring sense of compassion mm -hmm. and humility, um, particularly when I think of all my parents had to sacrifice um, for me to be where I am and their continual pursuit of that American dream. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I have um, didn't have my parents around as much, but what was around was their level of expectation that they had of me and my sisters of what we would do here. And so for that little girl, I would say thank you. And I would tell her and any little girl, know that God has got you. God has got you. Like um, whether for good or for bad, that it's going to be OK. Yeah. You know, if you just hang in there, it's going to be OK. Last words of wisdom before we close this thing out for that, that woman, that mother who may be single, who's struggling to raise her kids and she wants the best mm -hmm. out of them and she's working two or three jobs, but she's doing it because she knows that one day her cocoon, her situation is gonna make butterflies out of her kids. Yes. For that little girl who, you know, she may not be the most popular. She looks on Instagram and she's like, my hair doesn't look like that. Come on. But I am who I am, but I don't have anybody to reinforce that. Right. Um, as a mother, and it's tough sometimes you have to give yourself, give all of yourself, pour everything you have into your child. Uh, certainly I believe in raising, since my daughter's grown, I raised her and freed her. Uh, but I poured everything I had about the fundamentals of life, how to be a woman, what to expect in life. I wanted her to stand up when others sit down. I said, you're a leader, um, never be a follower. Mm -hmm. I want you to uh, understand the values of life and what it means to be the woman that you are. She's a teacher at Douglas County High School. I teach 11th grade English. She's the head cheerleading coach, and she's just an all-around leader. Uh, I'd like to say one thing as a mother. Mothers, uh, we go far beyond the ordinary to make sure that our babies have what they need. Mm -hmm. And that mother that's struggling, I know it's tough now, but tell her God will give her double for her trouble mm -hmm. if she just do what she's doing now. And she will reap benefits of what her babies in fact they will become great and then they'll come back and pull her with them mm. but mothers we will go to the extreme to make sure that we give our babies what they need yeah. we will we will walk through fire for our babies and that's what i did for mine you know and you want them to be the best yes. they can be and you just keep pouring into them but you can't give up um, moments when you want to cry you have to stand strong for them and when they don't make certain things, such as competing for sports and things of that sort, it's hard when they come home and say, I didn't make it. Yeah. But I just pick her, you know, I would pick her back up and I said, we're going to try again. Don't give up. Because I've had moments when she didn't, she tried out for just a classic example of AKA mm -hmm. uh, for uh, that, that's a sorority. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a D divine nine in uh, North Carolina, a and is where she graduated from. She called me screaming, I didn't make it. They didn't pick my name. And you know, mm -hmm. she's the only child. So she's accustomed to me giving her everything. Mm -hmm. I said, I can't give you this one. You have to earn it. Mm -hmm. So I just won't, uh, but she did earn it the next year. She ran her, I mean, she tried out her junior year and she became a, AKA that was important to her. But I always say children have to learn that you can't give it to them now. You can mm. set the path and set the tone, mm. but they must earn it. My parents taught me a man or woman that does not work shall not eat. And we don't want to hand up. We want to, we don't, we want to hand, we don't want handouts. We want hand ups. Mm. So I wanted, so that's just the fundamentals, but you have to be there for them. I, I know it's tough being a single mother. Mm. Uh, my former husband was a Marine, so I had a couple of tours where he was gone overseas and I had to raise her. And I know, I'm telling you, my hat is off to single mothers because you have to do it all. Yes. You're the dad, the mother, the father, you have to pick everybody up. And I'm telling you, my plate was full and there should be a special day for single mothers mm -hmm. in this country because mm -hmm. they are double duty. They do double duty. So Absolutely. much respect for yeah, our yeah, single mothers. Right. And, and a side note, because I am working on a single Mother's Day. Yes. A national yes. Single Mother's Day. Oh, yes. yes. As somebody who was raised by a single mom mm -hmm. um, and what I would say um, that I have to, you have to communicate that it's OK to not be OK. Mm -hmm. And it's OK for your kids to see you um, 
at your weak points and at your strong points because that's how they build resilience. Mm -hmm. um, and they need to see you overcome obstacles and hurdles and how you navigate challenge and adversity. Um, I don't think I would be as resilient as I am had I not um, mm -hmm. had to witness my mom go through adversity and challenges and triumphs and overcome a lot of those obstacles. Um, and kids do need to see that. Um, and it's okay. It, it, there's nothing wrong uh, with, with your kids seeing you at a point uh, where you feel that you're at your lowest. Um, what's important is they see that you overcome that and build that resilience. Um, and, and yes, I do have to also give a shout out to all the single moms because it is mm -hmm. not easy. Yeah. Um, and, and your kids, they need you. Um, and they need to see how you navigate this, this world around them uh, because that's also how they learn. Yes. Um, and that's also how they learn to navigate the world around them as well. Um, but strong kids come out of single parent households. I'm a product of a single yeah. parent household yeah. and I don't yeah. take that for granted. Wow. So yeah. there is hope. <laughs> wow. Yes. Wow. Vulnerability. Yes. That's what it's about. I used to give a lot of praise to my father for his influence. He's a manufacturing engineer and I became a manufacturing engineer. And my husband who pushed and prodded for me to run for office. Um, but it took um, some time afterwards to really appreciate the influence of my mom. Um, she and I did not have the best relationship growing up and my mom um, this is about me, but she grew up without a mom. So I know that she had to learn as she went along with raising me and my sisters. And um, my husband, excuse me, my father being an engineer traveled a lot. And my parents again were um, immigrants to this country. So they had to work pretty hard and she often was by herself. And we got a chance to see her vulnerabilities and frustrations. My mother uh, never went to college but she's the woman that made me read the dictionary. Mm -hmm. She valued education. Uh, my mother wasn't someone who probably doted after her every move, but she made sure me and my sisters were signed up for Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. And you know, my encouragement would be to just do what you can. Mm -hmm. Everything that you do will have a return to your children even if it's to see, I remember days my mother would be washing plastic sandwich bags so we can reuse them. Oh my God. And to know that that's the kind of commitment she had to making sure that um, our kids were gonna be, her kids were gonna be able to take lunch to school. That doesn't, that experience doesn't go wasted on me. Mm -hmm. So I just tell parents, do what you can to provide for your kids mm -hmm. they will, that will make them better for it. And beyond that, do what you can to love your kids. Mm -hmm. Love is not necessarily material things, but being present, mm -hmm. not necessarily presence, being present, mm -hmm. being honest, being open, sharing with them your challenges. Um, I have such respect for my mom and I hope she sees this. I think she's made me a very resilient person. I've seen her fight for us. I've seen her fight for me and my sisters to have academic opportunities that two little black girls shouldn't have had in our um, environments. When she would go to the school and demand that we be moved to the next honors class, she fought with whatever she could to get us the experiences that we had. You know, so when I think back over my life and I think about you know, just how I fight for things. And it's not just born in my parents' experience of coming here from another country and working hard. It's by what I've seen. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. by what I've observed. So I would just ask any single parent, any parent, being a parent, being married is hard. <laughs> just <laughs> do what you can. You know, do what wow. you can to just love on your kids. And fortunately mm -hmm. for me, you know, a lot of kids out here feel alone and isolated. With social media, they have pressures that none of us never had growing up. And they just need to know one person is there, one person's showing up for them. Mm -hmm. And um, they have opportunity to do that, even if it's not all your time, even five minutes a day of checking in, just letting them know you care goes a long way. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, as I said before, you know, 
my parents were very heavily involved in the civil rights movement. My mom um, worked very closely with Congressman John Lewis, and she would go to those sit-ins and be humiliated by those that didn't want them there, spit on, pulled off the counters, dragged out of places, and they would get back up and do it again so that we would have the rights to be able to go into restaurants and to be able to vote and to be able to be considered. We still fight each and every day for uh, equality and equity of our people. Um, but she, my mom is probably the strongest person that I know. And in spite of all of that, she still raised a family. My sister, myself and my sister and my brother. Um, and she always instilled in us that even through, through all the adversities that she went through, she was a hard worker. Mm -hmm. and she instilled that in us. Um, she always believed in taking care of others. She was always fighting for others. And I see that in myself a lot, you know, where I am always advocating for others mm -hmm. because sometimes people don't have a voice if you're not that voice for them. You know, I grew up in a time where, um, you know, it just wasn't always easy. You know, I, my parents were both working class, you know, people that, um, and, and my dad was a pastor. And, and so, you know, what you want to instill in your children is um, to have that faith in God as well. You know, I think that our faith yes. uh, carried us through a lot of uh, situations. Um, and so what I would say to just single moms or any parent, whether it's a mom or a dad, because you have dads that are raising our uh, children by themselves uh, today, is just to love, mm -hmm. show that compassion, and just be there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think that we've learned, the four of us, is that being able to have that circle of women that you can call up yes. or <laughs> text in the middle of the night, <laughs> which we do a lot of, to say, hey, you know, either checking in, just, hey, how you doing? or if there is something on their mind that we text and what, well, what do you think about this? Well, this is what I would do. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have someone that you can um, cry on the shoulder, you know, get that hug from, get that support mm -hmm. from. Or uh, laugh. Or laugh. Because <laughs> <laughs> we will send the, the laugh, laughing face with the crying. Mm -hmm. Uh, but just being able to have that support um, goes, a long goes a long ways. I think that it has helped us yeah. um, through the, you know, the time that we've been elected in this position. Yeah. Just being able to have one another, having a shoulder to cry on, but just never giving up. Right. And, you know, I can't, you know, everything that all of the the chairwoman here has said today, you know, if you take a little bit of everything mm -hmm. and you can build that pie, um, then you have all the ingredients that you need to be able to survive and to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. Because what fits for me may not fit for Chairwoman Cupid or may not fit for uh, Chairwoman Jones mm -hmm. or Hendrickson. Mm -hmm. But just the simple fact of just a little bit of what each of us have gone through, have experienced, continue to yeah. experience, um, you know, 
you could take that uh, and and apply it to what you may need at that particular time. That's so true. Wow. I feel a little remiss. I need to say something about my mother. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A great woman. Um, she is the hardest working woman in show business. She's <laughs> 85 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, she has uh, been a cosmetologist for 50 years wow. or 55 years. And Believe it or not, she's still curling hair. I told her, I said, Mom, when we uh, close, we're going to put some curling irons in there with you because you are just an amazing woman. She still have clientele. She, she, uh, she has wow. the honor of fixing the, uh, well, she's the, the uh, cosmetologist for the owner of the Lorraine Motel where Martin Luther King. Um, wow. Well, her, her parents were the owner, so uh, Carolyn Champion, so she still does her hair. But my mother was a disciplinarian. She has a 10th grade education. She mm -hmm. had nine brothers and sisters. And she's the oldest mm -hmm. of all the, of the siblings. And all of them are deceased now except three. Oh, and wow. she's the oldest. And I believe she'll still be standing. She's very tough. She, uh, my <clears throat> father was just amazing. He was just cool, calm, collected pers personality. But she led with conviction. Mm. She did not play. Mm. Uh, everybody knew my mother in the neighborhood because when she come in the room, everybody paused mm -hmm. because she was that woman of strength. But she was a sweet mom. She'll listen to you, but she's a worry wart. Mm -hmm. She won all her three siblings and she didn't really want me to run for office. She, she said, I'm nervous. And what she said to our sheriff pounds, he's the sheriff of Douglas County, before she walked away, you know, when I was inaugurated, she said, I need to talk to you. He said, yes, ma'am. She said, take care of my baby. Mm -hmm. He said, yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll, I'll do so. And he has. He has been amazing. Mm -hmm. And his uh, nephew, Lieutenant Pounds, is my uh, security detail. And I am just telling you, uh, I just wanted to say something because if she's looking, I just want to let her know I, I stand on her shoulders. Mm -hmm. She just won't quit. She don't even understand what the word retirement means. So I don't even talk about retirement anymore because that means I got to keep working. <laughs> so thank you, mom. I love you. Wow. And thank and just believe in your children yeah. and pour into them and love on yes. them and tell them how beautiful they are and how great they are yes. and be on the front row. Of, and you said when she was uh, uh, North Carolina a and I had my pom-poms out there. That's my baby. Everybody said, we know, but I was having a name. <laughs> she graduated from college. Yes. I, when she graduated, I had her photograph on the back of my jacket. Oh, I love so it. when I would go to all the games, they knew she was my baby. Mm -hmm. So you just have to just make them feel, feel special. Yes. If you have one or 100, yes. all of them need to feel special. And I believe yes. giving them that balanced love will yes. make them go far in life. And yes. just tell them you love them and yes. hug Amen. on them. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So, wow. That's something Carlotta said to you. I can't take away from it's just the power of faith. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you may not have all the riches in the world, but if you can put up a prayer, which you're here, mm -hmm. believe in yourself and for your children, believe in yourself to provide and know that God will make a way. Uh, my mother used to take us to church every mm -hmm. Sunday. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I remember her sitting there and teaching us how to read music. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, that gift is the gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. So that would be the one thing I'd add. Just add a faith center to your children. It, it goes a long way. Wow. Yeah. You know, Chairwoman Haro, you talked about the recipes for success. And I can tell you right now, I am full from hearing the words of wisdom that you have not only imparted in me, but from folks who are gonna be watching. And those words, if I could sum it up and correct me if I'm wrong, it's okay to be strong yet vulnerable. It's okay to have faith, but still believe in yourself. And it's okay not to be okay because at the end of the day, that's your story. And that's why we celebrate you, each of you, because you have told us your stories. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Deborah Tuff. See you next time.